Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Evan Wright. I'm going to talk about uh, developing for the ZX Spectrum and particularly the, t the tool chain that you need if you want to target this machine. Um, I'm always very excited to present at VCF. I, I never sleep very well the night before because I'm always like so worried about my presentation. Uh, so despite having like six giant bottles of Diet Coke, I'm still kind of uh, a little groggy. Hopefully this will be coherent though. Um, so a little bit about me. I teach uh, at a local vocational school and then I also teach at College of DuPage in the evening. I'm an adjunct there so I teach at both places. Um, so I teach at a place called COD and a place called TCD and that gets very confusing and I'm not really sure that my mom actually knows where I work. Um, so uh, I teach a high school class called uh, Computer Information Systems slash Game Design. That's what we have to call computer science now to get people to enroll. It's like, okay, well, nobody's signing up for physics, so let's call it Space Camp, right? So um, that, that's, how that, that's how that works. Um, but I, I do a lot with um, C Sharp and uh, 3D modeling using 3DS Max, and we're doing stuff with Unity. And we're also doing stuff with Text Adventure, which I'm going to talk a little bit about here, because that's how I got into the whole Spectrum project uh, in the first place. Uh, also, it's the 40th anniversary of the, you know, the trinity of uh, early home computers, Apple II, Commodore PET, TRS-80. Um, so I wanted to do some project that would tie these all together, but the TRS-80 and the Spectrum have the same processor in it. So once I got this thing targeting uh, my project working for the TRS-80, it was, I thought it would just be like three days of work to get it to work on the Spectrum. It turned out it was not. So uh, I'm going to tell you about the, the pitfalls of developing for the Spectrum. Um, so the thing that I've developed, uh, I've been working on for like the last maybe year or so, is this cross-platform cross text adventure system. So you can type in your Zork-like game and then uh, you hook up all the rooms, you can add all the objects, you can make all the functions, you know, like if I ring the bell, make sure the, draw, you know, the, draw, the drawbridge is now open, you can do that. Um, and then up here, there's a little menu that says export. Um, you, you can test your game on, on there, and then you say export, and you can export it to Apple II, you can export it to Commodore 64, you can export it to TRS-80, and now you can do Spectrum. Oh, and then some guy was like, well, does it do Amstrad CPC 464? I'm like, I don't know what that is. Um, but it turns out it's just a Z80 machine. So it was like three days of work to get it to do that machine too. Because um, they're, you know, once you've done it for one platform, it's the, it, the, the hard work is going to a new processor. If you already have the game running on one processor, it's not a big deal to port it to another pr computer that uses that processor. Uh, so that's what the interface looks like, and I'm actually using that in my classroom now. We just wrapped up a two-week unit on text adventure. So, but the whole thing here is that it, you can export it to we have one tool that exports to any of those classic computers, plus now Sinclair Spectrum. Um, there's also a really cool piece of software out there called Trisbort, which is a kind of a, I don't know, some, one of my students said, it sounds like this, something the Swedish chef would say. Right? Um, it's really good for making text adventure maps. And one of my students happened to open up a, save, uh, a map file, and he, it was just XML. And it, so it was really easy to read. So it was like just you know, a day of work to have this thing read in the Trisbort file. So you can build your nice map in the Trisbort software, and then just go import it into the Lantern software that I wrote. And it'll preserve all your rooms and make all the objects for you. So it saves a lot of time. So that's cool. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. So the way it works is there's a GUI, you build your game, and it saves your whole game out as an XML file. And then when you want to export it, the thing takes your XML file, and it cranks out assembly language files for the computer you're targeting. Um, so now in there, we can throw, we can throw a spectrum. Um, and then you run a, a script that runs an assembler, and it turns it into a bin file and makes a disk image or a tape image or whatever. Um, so these are those platforms it supports now. So there's, there's the spectrum in there. Um, Okay, so here are my students actually like using this thing. This is the Apple IIc that's out, out in the, on the show floor at my, at my table. So they build their games on the Windows PC, and then once, they, once it's ready to go, we take the, uh, the disk image and we move it over to the IIc using ADT Pro, and it actually writes out the, the floppy disk file. So we can take their game from the Windows 7 and actually put it on a floppy disk and run it on a real Apple II, and there's some of my students doing that. And then here's a wall of text adventures on five and a quarter inch floppy disks that my students have made. Right? Now there's, a, there's even more up there now. Actually the one in the middle, that's um, Plateau of the Past from Jim O'Keefe, he's local. So he, Jim's gonna like call me out on that. He's like, that's my game. But I put that up there so the students would have like, here's what a good game looks like. It's like kind of the, the target that they're going for. Um, okay, and that, this is all up on GitHub. In a, there's my name, right? GitHub slash me, Evan C. Wright. And then the thing is called Lantern. It's all up there if you want it. Um, okay, so which brings us to this. How, did you how do I take some code like that was, uh, and, and get it, how do I get a game running on the spectrum? 
I didn't really know much about the Spectrum uh, until like the 90s. I did ZX81 stuff when I was a kid, and when, the, when Wikipedia became available, right, I was like, whatever happened to that? And then I was like, oh, there's this thing called the Spectrum, and it looks really cool, so I should go buy one. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so for those of you who don't know, Sinclair, Clive Sinclair, is kind of like the British Steve Jobs. He's invented all sorts of things like the pocket calculator and uh, the C5 um, electric, uh, electric bicycle or electric car. It's really a kind of a battery-assisted bicycle. Um, now he spends most of his time, well, doing not so inventorly things. Uh, he was married a swimsuit model about 40 years younger than him. And I went to look that up, info on that. And it turns out he just dumped her and divorced her. And now he's romancing his old secretary. So I wish I'd never even bothered to look all that stuff up in the first place. I just wanted to remember it nice and like it was when I was a kid. So, um, But that's Clive Sinclair. He had a very successful line of computers for a while. But like most of the companies, they kind of crashed during the 8-bit wars. Um, so there's the first one, the, the ZX80. It's a Z80 powered machine. Um, CPU-driven video. It's black and white graphics, no, no sound. Um, but that was, that was a kit that you could buy and put together. That turned into this computer, uh, the ZX81, or in the US it was the Timex Sinclair 1000. Although there actually were some ZX81s in the States, like I had one. Um, again, Z80 powered. But this, this was kind of like an improved version of the previous one, but just in mass-produced form rather than as a, as a kit. Uh, and then it, finally it evolved into this thing, <coughs> which is what I'm going to talk about. So it still has the Z80 processor. It, had, it doesn't have CPU-driven video anymore. It's got this thing in it called the ULA, which does the video. Uh, now it has color, which is why it's called the Spectrum, uh, and, it has, and it has sound. So um, how, do you, how do you target something for, the, for this machine? Uh, oh, this is also super exciting, too. There's a Kickstarter campaign to, uh, for the, something called the Spectrum Next, which is kind of a reimagined uh, Sinclair Spectrum. Uh, the case is de designed by the same guy who did all the early Sinclair machines, so I, th I think that's pretty exciting. And then it has all the modern conveniences, like you want like an SD card, uh, an HDMI uh, video. So I'm, like, I'd, I'm a backer of that project. I would love to have this machine. I, ho I hope I do. I hope it works. Um, so and then the case is designed by the same guy. Okay. If you're really into this stuff, there's a great movie out there on YouTube that you can watch for free called Micro Men about the battle between Sinclair and Acorn Computer. It's really good. I did not realize that. I don't know how accurate the movie is, but it makes Clive Sinclair out to be kind of a psychopath. <laughs> Again, like, I kind of wish I had, didn't know that. I just wanted to remember it all nice like I was when I was, it was a, when I was a kid. Um, there's another cool movie out there called uh, From Bedrooms to Billions uh, about the early British computer industry. It's really, it's, it's, there's not much of a story arc to it. It's just a lot of interviews. But still, the interviews are very interesting. Hi, can I help you? Oh, OK. Hey, welcome. <laughs> I'm Evan Wright, by the way. Um, there's also a brand new book, uh, Spectrum of Adventure. It's all about Spectrum text adventures. Uh, it reviews a lot of them and talks about like, the development tools used to make them, which I thought was kind of interesting. So that was pretty good. Um, OK, so what do you need to actually write code? Well, you need an editor. I used Notepad++, uh, any Z80 assembler. I used Z80 Assem. Um, because I had used that on the TRS-80 project uh, that I had just wrapped up, and I didn't want to like have to learn a new set of symbols and all that, so I just I kept that assembler. But any one would work fine. Um, you need something to take your uh, assembled program and actually put it on a tape image. That's what MCTRD does. It, it allows you to take a tape image and attach files to it. Uh, and then you need an emulator. I use Spectaculator. Um, there's other ones out there. The one at the bottom, it's pronounced Zazarix, if that's really a pronunciation. I don't know. It, it could have come up with an easier name. <laughs> but So that, that, was, that, that was my tool chain there. Um, just emulator, Z80 assembler. MCTRD is kind of the glue that ties it all together. And then you need the emulator. Um, so how do you get the machine into the, uh, the program into the machine? Uh, in all my retro projects, there have been two ways to do this. You either have a, a machine that supports native uh, binary files natively, like um, Apple II does. There's like the brun command, like run binary file. And uh, the Cocos support that too. Um, and then there's other machines like the Commodore 64 or the ZX81, where what you, what you do is you take your machine language code and you have to embed it inside a basic program. Uh, because the machine is not really programmed to work with binary files. It's just pro all it knows is basic. So you have to hide your machine code in a basic program. 
So the Spectrum does something different, though. They actually, the, the basic that's built into it is much better than the one that was in the Timex Sinclair 1000 and the ZX81. It actually supports loading chunks of data into a, a location in memory. And then there's a command, a user command, which could jump to that chunk and run it. So you have a basic loader that says, OK, load the program into some other area of memory, and then jump into that memory and run it. So it's actually, it was actually pretty convenient. Uh, here's the, the loading program. And you, what you do is you just open up Spectacular, and you type this in, and then you save it to a tape image. And then you put that tape image aside, because you can reuse that tape image for every, every other Spectrum game that you ever write. Uh, so clear the screen. Um, also, because it's tape-based and it takes a long time to load tape, you probably want to have a loading screen. <laughs> Um, so the player has something to, or the user has something to look at. This command load blank blank or you know or quote 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 screen. That says load the first thing you find on the tape into the screen memory. Uh, and I can't remember what the poke the poke does. I think that suppresses the the command prompt. Uh, so uh, what this does is it loads the loading screen and then it goes to the next thing and it says load the next thing you find. The, you know, and the, the empty quotation means, like, don't worry about the name. Just, just load the first thing you find into that memory address, 25,000 uh, decimal. And then jump to 25,000 decimal and run whatever code you find there. So that's, that's your loader. That's the stub that's going to bring in your program. And then you just make that once, and you save it to a tape image, and you can use that all, all over again. So basically, there's, there's three things here on your tape image, the loader, the loading screen, and then the actual program that you compiled with Z80SM. Pardon me, I'm losing my voice. <coughs> um, so OK, so I just, I just said that, I think, right? So you just type it in manually in Spectacular, save it as a tape file, and then you attach the stuff to, to the tape image. Um, so type this, okay, I just did it. Sorry, I was doing this late last night. Um, so the loading image, right? How do you get that? There's paint tools out there. Uh, I think I use ZX Paintbrush. I just made up something in Photoshop that was the right screen resolution, which is 192 by 256. And then it can do the conversions. Uh, and it'll actually save it. This SCR file is the Sinclair memory. It's a screen file dump, basically. So it can save it out in the format so when the, the loader loads it in, it'll actually look nice on the screen. It's basically a, a SCR is a Sinclair memory dump. Um, so that's how I got that. And then you just sit there bashing away at it until it actually works. Um, with the Z80 assembler, the, the, by the, that's just targeting the TRS-80, so it always puts this little header on there. So I had to use this dash com option. So it would, um, it would suppress putting that little header on there. Um, and that was just one little hiccup there. Um, so the memory map, um, all the ROMs at the bottom, RAMs at the top, like most Z80 machines. Then the screen memory is down here, like right at the end of the ROM. Um, the screen memory is really organized in a really weird way. So there's the, you cannot just peek and poke stuff into memory if you wanted to make some sort of character-based game. I've never seen anything like this. You know, any Sinclair machine, there's always going to be some real weirdness to it. Um, I'm sure there was a really good reason why they did this, but I don't know what it was. Normally, you would think the first line in the screen memory would be the first line of video on the screen. And like the second chunk of pixels would be the second line on the screen. And the third chunk of pixels would be the third line on the screen. It does not work that way at all. The screen, which is 192 by 256, is broken up into three chunks of uh, 64 by 256 pixels. Um, each one of these chunks is then further broken up into chunks of eight lines. So you would probably think, OK, this is like the first line, second line, third line, fourth line, fifth line. No, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> the first chunk contains the first lines of the eight chunks. Of, of that part of the screen. So it's a, it's a chunk of first lines, a chunk of second lines, a chunk of third lines, a chunk of fourth lines. It's, it's really weird. Um, and it made, so I had to write a routine to scroll the text. And it was, it took me a while because you have to take into account all the, the way that, that the, you can't just do like a mem copy kind of thing. It's all laid out really weird. 
Now, when I actually do a demo of how, how this thing loads, you'll see, you know, it's kind of confusing. When you see it load, you'll be like, OK, I get, I get what it's doing. But it's, it's, a ch it's the chunk of first lines for that block, the chunk of second lines, and then all the way down to the, like, the, the chunk of eight lines. So you, if you just poked it in, into something into memory, it would get scattered all over the screen. Um, the machine does actually, I mean, it has color. It's, you know, they say 16 colors, but light black is still black. You know, so there's a light and dark for every color. Um, but black is kind of duplicated. Um, and the screen, the colors are stored in a chunk of memory just past the video screen. So a after the screen memory, there's another chunk of 768 bytes that store color information. And the way it works is the screen is grouped into um, little cells that are 8 by 8. And then with, e so every cell on the screen is mapped to an attribute. And that attribute can store a foreground color and a background color. And so that means that you cannot have more than two colors in any 8 by 8 cell on the screen, which is kind of strange. But I mean, I, I guess a lot of old computers are like that. I mean, Apple and Commodore. I guess that, that's how they did it, just because the, the, they didn't have the, enough memory available. Um, and then there's a so every bit or every eight by eight cell on the screen's got a foreground, background, and then it's got two bits: one to say whether to flash that thing, and what it does is it just inverts the the foreground and background every half second. And high low is whether to kind of make the thing the color bright or not. Th this actually really explains like why Sinclair games look the way they do. So here's the, the color palette um, with the light and the dark, right? The black is just light, you know, light black is still black. Um, so notice in these games, there are a lot of colors on the screen, but you don't see them next to each other. So it, it's like they almost have this kind of, it's like a colored monochrome almost. Um, so yes, there are colors, but there's, there's a foreground color and a background color. It's not, you don't see those overlapping. And there's no hardware sprites like a Commodore has. So you could you know, throw more colors on top of that. But that, so that's, that, that's why um, the, these games look the way they do, is that um, there's this limitation in the hardware of it. You can't have more than two, two colors next to each other in an 8x8 cell. Um, so uh, let me give you a little, a little demo here. Um, oh, actually, is this a video? Um, I think that, that was supposed to be a video. Um, there we go. So I'm gonna, this is what it looks like when it loads the screen. And you're going to see it's going to load the first chunk of lines, the second chunk of lines, the third chunk of lines. Um, and then last, it's going to load the attributes and then set the appropriate colors on uh, every 8 by 8 chunk of, of the screen. So, you'll, so what I'm doing is I've selected the tape image um, that, I, that was the end result of the, the development process. And now I'm going to like play and type load. And we're probably going to hear some screeching noises here. Oh, it's not too bad. OK, so now we're loading the. It's first, it's going to load the loader. And the loader says, OK, load the screen file, and then go load the game. So right now, what it's doing is, um, load, there we go. OK, so see how it's loading the first, the first lines, second lines, third lines, fourth lines, right? all of the first chunk. And now it's going to do that for the second chunk of the screen, first lines, second lines, third lines fourth lines. Right. So you could see if you tried to peek and poke something into this memory, it would just be a big mess. And, no, and the colors are all wrong on this, right? But that'll get fixed when it loads the attributes, worth it, which are at the very end of the memory dump. Right. So there we go, like seventh lines, eighth lines. Now, finally, we get to the attribute bytes. And you can see that those are tiling in eight, eight at a time. There we go. And now it's actually going to, um, that should be done. There, there we go. So that, that's, does that kind of explain, I hope that, that kind of allows you to visualize what's going on there with that, that screen file. Um, other stuff that just drove me endlessly nuts while I was trying to do this, the TRS-80 basic was written, was, was ported from the Altair. No, not the Altair. Um, the, it was ported from, uh, wait, what, 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 what did the Altair have in it? The 8080? Yeah, OK, so yeah, it was ported. Yeah, the, 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 TRS80 for the, the basic for the TRS-80 was ported from the Altair basic, which was running on 8080. So the Altair basic r runs on the TRS-80, or that, that basic on the TRS-80 does not use the IX and the IY registers, because the 8080 doesn't have the IX and the IY registers. Those were added to the Z80 later, right? That's what, you know, that, was, that was the addition. That was one of the things that Zilog like, added to that chip. Um, 
when, you know, when they took it and kind of made, made the better Z80 version of it. Um, so there is no restriction on using IX and IY registers if you're writing code that runs on a TRS-80. However, I did not realize that the Spectrum basic routines use the IY register. So I had written all this code that uses the IY register, and then my Sinclair stuff would just crash endlessly, and it wouldn't seem to crash at any logical point. Like it wasn't, I couldn't figure out why it was crashing. So what would happen is there'd be an interrupt, and then the, you know, the, the, whatever, the interrupt handler would do something, expect the IY register to have some value in it that was you know, left over from the previous time that there was an interrupt, and it would go on its merry way. However, I had corrupted the IY register, not realizing that this, the ROM routines themselves use it. Um, so it was crashing during an interrupt. So don't use the IY register. Um, there were two ways around this. You could, I could have rewritten everything, but I was lazy and I didn't want to. Um, the other way to do that is there's uh, an instruction, there's two instructions, disable interrupts and enable interrupts. So anytime I had to do stuff with IY, I would call DI to disable the interrupts, do whatever I needed to do, and then re-enable the interrupts, and that worked. Um, so I was happy with that. Um, so those are the, the two big pitfalls that you will run into. So don't use the IY register. If you're coming from another platform, there's, you know, you would you'd never think in a million years, oh, of course, of course the operating system might be using that. Um, you can't peek and poke into the screen memory um, because it's got that, that kind of, that odd layout where the lines are scattered all over the place. Um, make a, you can make a, uh, paint, sorry, a loading screen using ZX Paintbrush and export it as an SCR file. That's basically just a memory dump. Um, and then create your tape file with uh, Spectaculator and then you can use MCTRD to attach the, the files to your, um, to your tape image, and, uh, and, and then off, off you go. So that's, uh, uh, and then let's see, all of this is online. I made a little cheat sheet that has like all the, the, lo the code for the loader. It's got the, like the MCTRD commands to do the attachment. Um, and uh, all of those notes are up online at mrwrightteacher.net slash spectrum. And uh, that should be, everything that you need to get going with the spectrum would, is, is in that document. And it's not a very long document. So um, no reason not to go write some spectrum games. So. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.